Good evening and welcome to Poland Daily. I'm Nicholas Richardson and this is the news. Today, the Prime Ministers and senior figures from 14 European countries, including those from the Western Balkans, met at a high-profile meeting in Poznan, Poland, to discuss the challenges and prospects for the region. The European Union confirmed its commitment to strengthen cooperation with the region with a set of concrete measures, focusing on five key areas – transport and energy, digital, economy, security and good neighbourly relations. We emphasize that where there are some historical differences, it is worth focusing on economic cooperation, on mutual investments, in particular on investments in six Balkan countries, the Western Balkans. We stress that trade exchanges, as well as the promotion of young entrepreneurs, startups, small and medium-sized enterprises, is the right way to future integration. We talked about all of this today at several sessions, and although we are perfectly aware that the relations between the Western Balkan states are burdened with certain problems and are experiencing certain problems today, we try to present a certain goal, the goal of European integration, integration within the European Union. We strive to encourage close cooperation with each other. Poland shares its experience in the field of building efficient state institutions, local government and tax institutions. No one will guarantee you a painless and costless entry into the European Union. We, the Polish nation, know from our own experience that it is a complicated and demanding process which requires big changes and sacrifices. You will have to implement reforms which are unpopular. You will have to cope with the dissatisfaction of some privileged groups whose interests will be violated and to build democratic institutions and a free market economy. But let me stress that joining the EU is worth it. The integration process itself is not a value in itself, it becomes a value only with the decision of the community to expand it. A three-day conference of the Law and Justice Party and the United Right began today in Katowice. The event is considered to be one of the most important events on the right-wing Polish political scene before this autumn's elections to the Polish Parliament. Think about Poland 2019 was the slogan of today's Law and Justice Party's convention held in Katowice. As the leader of the party, Jarosław Kaczyński, announced earlier, the convention is going to be a huge brainstorming session. As he said, the best possible solutions for our country will be discussed during the meeting. The participants touched on the subject of the responsible development of our economy, energy politics and environmental protection. We need a brainstorm. We want to hear not only ourselves, because of course we have different points of view, but also we want to hear experts who do not praise the Law and Justice Party, but honestly say what's good and what's wrong in their opinion. We want to make a summary in all the fields we modified after the Civic Platform Party and the Polish People's Party government's term of office. This meeting is also some kind of preparation before reporting back to Poles what we have done. Now that people consider Poland as one of the leaders when it comes to the world's economic development, it is a great commitment, because we have to do what we did before to keep that level. The leader of the Law and Justice Party, the Agreement Party, the United Poland, will give their speeches tomorrow, as will the former and current Prime Ministers of Poland. Yesterday evening, the Polish Parliament accepted a special bill to allow for the building of a museum of the Westerplatte and the 1939 war in this historic area by the Polish seaside. The Westerplatte was where the Second World War started for Poland when German forces attacked on the 1st of September 1939. The opposition parties are against the bill, as is the municipal government of Gdansk, which owns part of the area of the Westerplatte. Yesterday, we witnessed yet another stage of the legislative process which is aimed at allowing the Polish state take over the place we are in now. There would probably be nothing wrong with that if all of us, including the combatants, historians, museum workers, all sat down at one table and agreed to one idea of how the memory of this historic place should be preserved. Behind you there is a sign saying no more war. Right now we don't know whether it will remain here or not. 
Behind me there is a monument, we don't know whether it will remain here or not. But we know one thing, the Polish government is using force because this is how this legislation should be perceived, to use historic memory for political gains. First and foremost, it is not the law and justice government, but the Polish government that wants to create a museum on Westerplatte. You all better get accustomed to the fact that the Polish government, which received a democratic mandate, resides here in Warsaw. This government won the elections and recently it confirmed this social mandate in the elections to the European Parliament. If anyone is inciting a war in a place as holy as Westerplatte, then it is the municipal government of Gdańsk against the Polish government. Soon we will return to the moon, and one day, very soon, we will stick the American flag on Mars. There is nothing impossible for the Americans. So said United States President Donald Trump during a speech after the great Independence Day parade in Washington, D.C. Trump's announcement was like the commitment made 58 years ago by another U.S. president, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, who promised that Americans would land on the moon. On Thursday, through the streets of Washington and in hundreds of other American cities, colorful parades took place to commemorate the adoption of the Declaration of Independence by the Founding Fathers of the United States in 1776. Thousands of Americans and tourists from around the world lined the avenue of the Constitution in Washington to watch the largest parade. These mass celebrations did not please everyone, with critics saying that such an important national holiday should not be politicized. And I think, you know, reducing our nation to uh, tanks and, and, and shows of muscle just makes us look like the, the kind of loudmouth guy at the bar instead of the uh, uh, extremely diverse and energetic nation that we are. In front of the White House, people who burned the American flag were arrested. However, for the vast majority of Americans, the celebration of Independence Day is an important part of tradition. I came down here to have a good time, so uh, I'm not too upset. I mean, yeah, I definitely have to be conscious of how you spend taxpayer money. Um, but it's an interesting topic. Is it, a, is it a rally or is it a celebration of the 4th of July? And oh, I think everybody came out to have a good time. After the military parade, and for the first time in the history of Independence Day celebrations, President Donald Trump spoke from the platform in front of the Lincoln Memorial, a symbol of national unity. That same American spirit that emboldened our founders has kept us strong throughout our history. To this day, that spirit runs through the veins of every American patriot. It lives on in each and every one of you here today. It is the spirit, daring and defiance, excellence and adventure, courage and confidence, loyalty and love that built this country into the most exceptional nation in the history of the world. And our nation is stronger today than it ever was before. It is its strongest now. The celebrations ended with an impressive fireworks display that illuminated a sky full of storm clouds and a concert at which performed, among others, the OJs, Patti LaBelle, and the National Symphony Orchestra. That's the news. Thank you for watching. Stay with us for the weather, Poland Daily Business and more programs. But from me, it's have a good night and a better tomorrow. I'm Aleksandra Zarzycka and welcome to Poland Daily Weather. Let's take a look at the forecast for tonight. Temperatures will grow up a little to 14 degrees in Wrocław and Kraków. The coldest places that night will be located on the north. 9 degrees is expected in Olsztyn. Light overcast is across the country except Mazury. There we will see cloudless sky. Let's see the forecast for tomorrow. Temperature will increase to 29 degrees in Wrocław. The minimum temperature will be 19 degrees on the north. Plenty of sunlight will appear on the south, but in central Poland, downpour is expected. Let's check the weather for the next days. On Sunday, temperature will range from 20 to 22 degrees. Lots of sun will across the country. Monday will bring us a little higher temperature from 19 to 21 degrees. Tuesday will be very similar, but with rainfalls on the northwest. Thank you for watching and goodbye.
Poland Daily Business Edition. Uh, tonight uh, we'll talk about the cutting edge of uh, technology, robotics. Uh, Bartłomiej Szponacki of Planeta Robotów is our guest, sir. Thank you very much for coming to this show. Thank you very much as well. And uh, let us say about robotics a few years ago, we've been told that uh, uh, eventually robots will take over most of uh, simple jobs and and the jobs like a uh, cab driver like uh, shopping assistant like some warehouse worker are pretty much redundant mm -hmm. uh, is it still so we are looking you are you look at the development of the robotics can you confirm that or deny? yes i think that's the um that's the aim of uh, of robotics you know to automate uh, things that people do uh, to make their life easier. So, uh, on the w one hand, you can say that the jobs will be taken by the robots, right? So, um, uh, people will not have their works. But on the other hand, the new uh, type of works will um, come out, which weren't present in the, f in the past, right? So, uh, for instance, uh, there will be uh, still much need for uh, engineering, for um, IT guys, right? So, uh, I know it's hard for uh, collar workers to uh, transist into uh, some high tier um, analytical uh, position right, right but uh, still there were there will be many new uh, positions for those people and they i believe they won't be redundant uh, in the future mm -hmm. you do see the market of uh, robots we hear about robots being developed in places like boston robotics that's absolute cutting edge right. technology do we have something like that in poland can we say that polish companies are trying to catch up or trying to find out their own niche markets for the for the robots yeah there are a few uh, companies here in poland so it's not like um we are not participating in the market but as you said the cutting edge technology is still on the west mostly um but poland is is still trying to catch up uh, on those fields uh, but uh, as we talked previously uh, about um youngest uh, about children and how they uh, learn code code there are some few companies that are very popular uh, throughout the world uh, f by making their own robots such as Fulton uh, this is a great tool for kids to to start their journey with uh, robotics let us few, few uh, let us say a few words about the Fulton robots because that's the Polish idea developed here in the country that's right uh, they are on the market for the few years uh, they've gained um, some donation from U European this is Union. Uh, entertainment robot this is educational robot and most, built for children yeah most mostly educational uh, it is the, his purpose is to educate but uh, they does it. Uh, they achieve them. I uh, achieve it through uh, through play. So it's um, for children. It's a great way to to learn new things. As I said, through play because it's much easier for them to participate. They are much more eager to uh, to perform uh, some tasks, to do some coding because it's um, it's like a game for them, right? So uh, they are still having fun, but there is uh, still uh, a lot of science, a lot of knowledge that are being uh, given for them, and they didn't even notice it because it's so much fun for them. But still, it's a great value for them. Right, right. So one idea is to build robots from the scratch using the ready blocks that that contain uh, engines that contains connections that contain some circuits uh, and uh, kind of intelligence that's available or sensors obviously that's right. the robots are all about sensors and the other thing is to have a whole thing built pre-built and interact with the that's right uh, in, in right. pre-projected ways that's right uh, by, by by designers of the of the robot which way of those is better uh, you know it depends uh, of uh, it depends on um, age uh, for kids right because the, as you said the pre-built model which is already constructed is great for younger kids because they it, it, they, are, they are unable to construct such a complex th complex things by by their own right so it's a ready thing to uh, to um, to start uh, the journey with uh, robotics but for the adults uh, 
mostly in higher schools, right? Uh, there are many variety of products which are, as you said, just in pieces, almostly, which have to be connected uh, each other in a certain way too. Uh, bless you. <laughs> Thank you. And this is not unlike the building the, 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 the industrial robots, because you are also taking the parts that are on the market and construct the robot for your own needs, for your own purposes. Yes, you know, the parts and the whole idea is, is basically the same. But uh, in the industrial level, the scale is much bigger. Uh, those uh, servos, those sensors, as you said, they are much bigger, they are much more precise. So, because they have to perform multiple tasks with extreme precisions. Uh, so, uh, it's much different in those fields, but in general, the basics are the the same uh, so but the ki but the children and uh, the regular uh, people they don't have to, uh, to, to they don't have to s have such a precision um, parts elements which are much cheaper if they are not so precise right so uh, right now there is as I said there's a vari variety of products very affordable uh, for almost anyone uh, so it's very easy to, 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 to use to them for children is both fun and education that's and, right. and the biggest fun of the education is that they don't know they learn that's things, right. right that's right that's right <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much Bartłomiej Szponacki of Planeta Robotów who works with children learning them how to code how to construct how to think about robots well, that was our guest sir thank you very much and that was it for tonight's Poland Daily Business <laughs>
w zasadzie w granicach tegoż, tegoż budynku. It was a place where people could spend the night and defend themselves against invaders. However, Kazimierz Ludwig Bieliński started the rebuilding of the palace at the end of the 17th century, between 1682 and 1696. The palace became the summer home, the summer residence. Zaczął go budować Kazimierz Ludwig Bieliński. Tell us about the inspiration for the palace. You know, you've got it's quite an original design. What inspired this? Bielińscy, um, Kazimierz Ludwik Bieliński i jego żona z Morsztynów mieli rezydencję. Um, Kazimierz Ludwik Bieliński, together with his wife, had a residence at the Krakowskie Przedmieście Street. They decided to build a summer home surrounded with a beautiful landscape by the water here. Razem nad wodą. That's why the palace is decorated with things connected to the nature, both the Taipanium with Bakchenalias, but also decorations inside the palace are murals showing nature. They wanted the decorations to match. So the first family, the uh, Bielinski family, were used this place as their, their, their summer home, which sounds quite spectacular when you consider the size of the place. Could you tell us something about the Polish aristocracy at, at the time uh, this was built? Może w takim razie uzupełniając powiem, że obecny kształt pałacu jest The current shape of the palace resulted from the rebuilding that took place in the 18th century, in the middle of the 18th century to be exact. Before that, the palace had only the main body, which can only be seen only from the entry door facade side. It didn't have bed chambers and outbuildings, which were built later on. That's why the cubature of the building wasn't that big. Of course, it looked like a summer villa where the owners lived from March to September. They were throwing a family but also official parties. They were inviting guests from the aristocratic families, but also the King Augustus II. Unfortunately, we don't know how the palace was furnished, because none of the iconographic sources from this period survived. But because we know what the Bielinski family had in their residences in Warsaw, we can suppose that the palace was very rich decorated with elements of Baroque and Rococo. Residencjach w Warszawie bogato i um, reprezentacyjnie wyposażony w sprzęty. We know that the palace was rebuilt a few times at the beginning of the 18th century. When the other elements of the palace were built, for instance the bedchambers, which can be seen from the garden side, we know that the owners lived here at that time. The Bielinski family ran a factory in Karczewo. Kazimierz Ludwik's son, Franciszek Bieliński, established it. The Rococo style of furniture were made there. They were golden, sculptured, elegant and rich. And we suppose that the palace was furnished this way. The couch that survived in the Villanov collections shows how the furniture in the palace could look like. You can see it in the exhibition in the Villanov Palace. Po kanapie, która zachowała się w zbiorach wilanowskich, jest na ekspozycji w, w pałacu w Wilanowie można ją obejrzeć. With the Bielinski family just using this as their, their summer residence, they, they were back in Warsaw during the rest of the year. And, and what were they doing and, and who were they? Tak, Bielińscy na okres jesienno-zimowy wracali do Warszawy. The Bielińscy family used to come back to Warsaw for the winter season. One of the reasons was the fact that the palace is surrounded by the water. It is a natural part of the Oxbow Lake of the Vistula River from the west and north side and a built fake canal from the south and east side. All this means that the palace was built on an artificial island. There was also cold and steamy in the palace. Franciszek Bieliński used to write letters to his guests, saying that he can't invite them because it was too cold. As the outbuildings were built, he could finally invite them. 
the outbuildings were very important when it comes to the development of the residence itself and life here. We know that they decorated with shells and sand baths in the outbuilding located in the east. Some part of it survived. It was discovered during the research in the 1970s. Badań w latach 70. Natomiast oficyna zachodnia służyła The outbuilding in the west served as a kitchen which had huge ovens. Some sources say that they were so huge that it was possible to bake two bullocks at the same time. It indicates that there were many festivities here, with participation of not only the family, but also politicians, ambassadors, and the king himself. And that says a lot. Także politycy, ambasadorowie, a także właśnie król ze swoją świtą, to już może na coś wskazywać. Thank you very much for joining us here from Otvox Palace. We'll be back again same time tomorrow for another episode of Poland Daily Culture. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Poland Daily History. Today we are visiting the Polish Central Bank and the Center of Money, where they provide education on the history of various world currencies and the Polish Zloty. Join us as we learn about the 1,000 years of history of the Polish currency. During our visits to the NBP Money Center, we will speak with Adam Skrauta from the Education and Publishing Department of Narodowe Bank Polski. The Polish Central Bank functions under its current name since 1945, but is a continuation of two earlier banks, operating in the 19th and early 20th century, serving a similar function. So we're now here at the Polish Central Bank talking about the history of the Polish currency, namely the Zloty. And we're coming close to the Second World War era of the Polish history. And as we know, this is also a very chaotic and very turbulent time for Poland. And I was wondering how did that chaos reflect upon the Polish monetary system? You know, what are the effects of the Germans or the Russians have on the Polish currency and the way things are monetized? Uh, when uh, Germany and uh, the Soviet Union uh, invaded Poland, mm -hmm. the Polish government uh, withdrew um, first to Paris, then to London, mm -hmm. uh, and together, uh, together with them uh, also the central bank uh, evacuated from Poland. Mm -hmm. So the issue of the rightful currency took place mostly in London. Mm -hmm. Uh, however, the occupied territories of Poland uh, had new system introduced by the occupants. Uh, so, uh, when we talk about uh, the Germans, uh, some parts of, of the territory, of Polish territory they invaded, were directly incorporated uh, into, into the Third Reich, mm -hmm. and some uh, from part of it. Uh, there, there was a provisional state uh, called uh, the general government. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this territory they introduced uh, something, a, cu a currency called uh, złoty. Mm -hmm. However, it had little to do with our mm -hmm. his, uh, historic, historical think. currency. Uh, it, was a, it, was a German, it was a German currency uh, which served uh, the purpose of, uh, of the German war machine. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the same case was with the Soviet Union. When the Soviet Union uh, took uh, eastern part of Poland, they withdrew um, Polish Zloty and uh, introduced their, their currency, namely ruble. Um, so uh, we can say that until 1945, uh, there was no sovereign independent Polish currency uh, on our territory. Right. So we know the central bank has a deposit of gold and I was wondering what happened to it when the Germans or the Russian invaded Poland during World War II. Were they able to retrieve the gold or were they just confiscated by the invaders? 
Uh, yes, it was it was a race against uh, against time uh, because uh, the the Germans were very willing to put their hands on, on our gold reserves. <laughs> Imagine. Uh, and uh, the the em the employees of uh, of the Bank of Poland, the Second Central Bank, really uh, came to great lengths to to save the gold and mm -hmm. to to withdraw it for Poland uh, together with the government and and the bank employees and uh, actually they succeeded so not a single gold bar uh, were taken by the germans wow uh, and the the journey the journey of our gold reserves was very dramatic uh, we can we can say that it traveled all over the world so from poland to romania mm -hmm. to turkey to africa to france <laughs> back to Africa and from Africa some some of them to the United States to Canada and to Great Britain uh, and what is really amazing is that uh, nothing was nothing was lost uh, along the all journey that journey then transportation it was kept in the field. so uh, the employees of of the Bank of Poland uh, took a very close supervision on on all this process and uh, they often uh, personally visited uh, and inspected mm -hmm. this, uh, the condition of all these crates with, with gold bars. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, after the war, after, uh, our gold reserves uh, returned here to Poland after some negotiations with, uh, with the superpowers. Mm -hmm. Poland lay in ruins after the Second World War. And when the Soviet Union took control of the country in 1945, everything from infrastructure to the national currency had to be rebuilt. The Polish Central Bank was re-established, but since it had to operate in a communist economic system, the independence was severely limited. So shortly after the Second World War, the Soviet Union took over Poland and installed communism, which is a complete different financial system. I was wondering, was there anything left of a previous financial system or how the new financial system was implemented after the arrival of the Soviet Union? Uh, well, in their official, propag official propaganda, uh, the Soviets detested uh, the Second Republic of Poland. Mm -hmm. Uh, so uh, the idea was to um, to introduce uh, Zwote again, but uh, based on a completely new system. So there was no continuation, direct continuation mm -hmm. uh, between the pre-war uh, period and uh, after 1945. Mm -hmm. um, the system was completely different. Mm -hmm. There was. Uh, there, there were no. It wasn't based on gold, on foreign currencies, mm -hmm. uh, and also um, in 1945, uh, Narodowy Bank Polski was established. Mm -hmm. um, however, its purpose, its role was completely different at the time. Sure. Uh, there was no, uh, there was no independent monetary policy, mm -hmm. and actually, it was the government uh, that decided. Uh, how uh, how much money is needed in circulation, mm -hmm. and if the government asked, uh, the uh, the bank uh, printed and issued the money. And during during this time, during the socialist uh, period, uh, there were uh, numerous uh, issues. Mm -hmm. uh, in the uh, interestingly enough, the first issue was printed in Moscow. All right. Just before the the Poland ter the Polish territory was retaken by mm -hmm. the Soviets, and only after after then uh, there were several issues over the the, the course of the next few decades, uh, in the 40s, in the 50s, but also in the 70s, mm -hmm. um, and uh, over time, uh, as uh, as this economic system was failing mm -hmm. uh, and started uh, to collapse. Uh, the problem of uh, inflation was uh, very apparent, right. and uh, we can we can learn about this when we have a look at uh, the at the previous issue where mm -hmm. the denomination of even two million zloty appeared. And the face of the bill says two million. Two million. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> which amounts to uh, nowadays 200 zloty. So you oh. can you can imagine how uh, how serious issue it mm -hmm. was at right. the time. So you were telling me earlier that the Poland was under communist rule during the time the central bank was not independent. They were under control of the government and they were being asked to print and issue certain banknotes. I was wondering what impact does it have on the Polish economy? Mm, the biggest problem was uh, the lack of uh, responsible and sustainable monetary policy, right. uh, which uh, resulted in very severe economic problem mm -hmm. towards uh, the last years of this uh, regime. Mm -hmm. uh, so the lack of independent, uh, the lack of independence was one issue, but it also uh, served a much different purpose uh, in this system. For example, it was uh, one big settlement unit, uh, settlement bank for all major uh, state uh, state enterprises mm -hmm. at the time. So uh, when there were some. Um, Money transfers mm -hmm. between between companies between enterprises. Mm -hmm. It was uh, it was uh, Narodowy Bank Polski that uh, settled all these transactions. So it was present everywhere. Uh, uh, traditional uh, other other banks uh, were very um, weren't very numerous, mm -hmm. and uh, Narodowy Bank Polski at the time uh, was responsible for such. Uh, Activities. So, Narodowy Bank, Pols uh, Narodowy Bank Polski was uh, carrying out op operations that nowadays are run by uh, commercial banks, which mm -hmm. is quite unusual right. comparing to its present <laughs> situation. <laughs> As we have seen today, the history of the Polish Lottie is long but at times tumultuous with wars, invasions, and periodical financial crises. However, today the Polish Central Bank has managed to keep the value of the Polish Zloty stable and secure. I'm your host Benjamin Lee, and I'll see you next time on Poland Daily History. What can you say about Turin that hasn't been said before? Well, it all depends on how you look at it. At any rate, we're going to give it our best shot to be a little different. Turin is perhaps the prime example of Gothic architecture in the world. Its medieval quality is virtually pristine. And fitting this setting, it's also the birthplace of Nicholas Copernicus, who taught us that the Earth goes around the sun. and not the other way around. I'm not going to say that this is everything you always wanted to know about Torum, but we're afraid to ask, but uh, it's close to it. This is certainly a city not to be missed. It's a pleasure to be enjoyed slowly and deliberately. It would take a couple of weeks to see everything in this city and really soak in the atmosphere, and that would still be pushing it. But we are doing our dead level best to show you the greatest hits of Torun. So sit back and enjoy the next few episodes as Torun is unveiled before your eyes. I'm Will, this is Poland Daily Travel, and we love to see you watching. Like us on YouTube and subscribe if you really, really like us. So join us for Poland Daily Travel does Torun. Hello everybody and welcome to another exciting edition of your favorite travel program about Poland, perhaps the greatest travel program about Poland ever made in the history of the world. At least that's what Chris, sitting across from me, who is a ginger master, we're in the gingerbread workshop here in Torun. Now I gotta tell you folks, no uh, story about Torun is possible without exploring the vagaries, the, the mysteries, the, uh, the uh, hermetic knowledge of gingerbread. Toron, yes, is the center of gingerbread, perhaps not only in Poland and Central Europe and in Europe, but the world. Yeah, exactly. Would that be correct? There is no gingerbread, folks, in Vietnam. Forget it.
If you want gingerbread, you must come here. Do not go to Vietnam. Do not go to Indonesia. You will not find gingerbread in Bali. I exactly. take I take my claim on that. Now, Chris, uh, as a ginger master, um, what do you do? What are you responsible for? Uh, as the gingerbread master, I'm responsible for my um, gingerbread uh, workshop. Uh, I'm, res I'm responsible for uh, people who are working here. Uh, I'm working uh, with them and for my guests uh, uh, like uh, you right now. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm uh, watching uh, your activities here because uh, every uh, guest uh, which uh, visit us uh, cannot uh, leave this place without uh, gingerbread. Uh, who no, I'm gonna buy some gingerbread. Uh, I'll you buy can some. you can buy, but you can buy. No, I'm gonna buy some. No problem. Okay, okay, okay. No, I will. But, but you can you buy gingerbreads which are easy. available what? for what? eating them. Yeah. What? Uh, you can buy here gingerbreads mm. which are available, available for eating them. But uh, with me, you can make decorative gingerbreads. They, oh, are, okay. they are very hard. But, but I gotta uh, make, I'm not a baker. Uh, but uh, with, no, my, no. <laughs> with my advices, uh, you will, she, you she will become. Probably, and, no, uh, ladies are bakers. And I'm a little worried. By the way, what is this? I see a lot of these. And last time I looked, this is what the ladies used to hit their husbands when they come home after too much vodka. They just smack them in the head with this when they come home late at night. Why do you have so many? Are there a lot of ladies working here with drunken husbands? Uh, yeah, because uh, during our, sh uh, our shows, uh, right now uh, we are sitting uh, here, uh, three people, yeah? But during our shows we've got here uh, 30 or more uh, people uh, by uh, one moment. And, uh, they so are people coming from all over the world to learn how to make gingerbread. Yeah, because <laughs> because, you're the ginger because gingerbreads from Toronto <laughs> are the best in the world. <laughs> of course, where else would you do it? Okay, and how long have you been doing this? Uh, I'm doing uh, it uh, probably three years, three or more, mm, three and a half. Uh, three and a, a little mm -hmm. more than three years. And did you go to Ginger University or? <laughs> no, is there uh, a gingerbread college or <laughs> no? Of course, there's not. Yeah, yeah I was I cooking was, school or something. Uh, no, no, no. I was yeah. uh, I was uh, learning from another gingerbread master. It's <laughs> traditional. Oh, yeah. it's yeah. like uh, okay. It's like Pinocchio's father was yeah, a yeah, carpenter, exactly. and then he would teach Pinocchio. Exactly, but, Pinocchio but it was not so off. easy because uh, every yeah. every gingerbread master. Yeah. Uh, was keeping his uh, recipe uh, in secret, so <laughs> it, uh, it was... Uh, Do you have, is, your sec is your recipe secret? Like Coca-Cola keeps their recipe for Coca-Cola in a vault, in a bank, in a big safe in Atlanta, and only a few people know... Yeah, the but secret. every gingerbread master uh, has, big, has uh, his big safe in, in your head. <laughs> so is your... In your head? No, um, no, this is a serious thing. So you have your own... Secret recipe that no one else knows? Yeah, yeah, but I will not tell you. <laughs> uh, gingerbreads uh, from Toro in, in this city, it, 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 uh, gingerbread, it has been the symbol of the city since uh, the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. Why? Uh, because... Uh, it seems a really odd thing to have as your symbol. But what did it, uh, today, but what did it mean in the Middle Ages? It must have been a mark of distinction. Uh, first, uh, gingerbreads uh, uh, were gift uh, for a special special guest of Toru. Mm -hmm. uh, f in the past, uh, uh, for a ruler of Russia, uh, perhaps, uh, for example, uh, Catherine Catherine the Second for uh, Catherine the Great. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. F yeah. Uh, for uh, Polish uh, kings and uh, queens and. Uh, as, 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 as today, they always uh, yeah. were very, uh, very expensive and they were very special gifts, gifts especially uh, gingerbreads uh, from Torun and especially decorative gingerbreads. Yeah? Mm -hmm. mm, Is got... it because of the ingredients or something that made it yeah, special? Yeah, because... Treat. Uh, it was a treat, right? Yeah, exactly, you got right. Very because special uh, treat, yeah. in the Middle Ages, uh, 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 from from the beginning, yeah? uh, from uh, to make traditional gingerbreads, we need uh, only three mainly ingredients. Uh, one is uh, flour, second is honey, uh, but third uh, there are uh, root spices. They weren't available here in Torun. Uh, they have to be imported here uh, 
uh, from far away India. In uh, the Middle Ages, transport of uh, spices to Europe was very mm, time consuming and dangerous. So the uh, spices uh, were very, very expensive. We've got uh, seven, uh, seven root spices which uh, we need to uh, make traditional gingerbreads. If you want, I can tell you a few words about yeah. uh, these spices. Go ahead. Yeah? Yeah. And I can show can you. You, sh you can, uh, Would you, you can, show? Yeah, you can uh, touch, you can smell them. Okay, great. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but uh, you want to move around? Maybe Carolina can. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, can yeah I will take them on the table. Okay, yeah. great. We'll just keep going. Yeah, sounds good. Ah, very nice. So, we, okay, let's see what we got here. Mm -hmm. One moment. I know what that is. That's cinnamon, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah, yeah it's a cinnamon. Yeah. That's cinnamon. Oh, this is fun. This is like pepper. Yeah. Hmm. I've lost two, uh, two of the spices, but I've okay. got well, the just in my hands. So make it up. Problem, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. First, uh, most important uh, spice for uh, gingerbread in our country, in uh, Poland, it's pepper. Because uh, okay. uh, the Polish name of uh, gingerbread, Piernik, comes exactly from the spicy flavor of uh, this uh, ingredient. Also in uh, German, when, uh, where uh, gingerbreads are very popular too, a German uh, name of uh, gingerbread, Pepperkuchen, or Pepperkuchen, or <laughs> something right, like this. Uh, hey, she speaks German, is that correct? Pepperkuchen. Pepperkuchen. What is it yeah. called? Uh, Pepperkuchen. Pepperkuchen. Yeah, it also comes okay. from the uh, word uh, uh, pepper, yeah? Yeah. Uh, it's the first uh, spice for okay. gingerbread. Uh, second, I unfortunately, I don't have it here. Uh, it's uh, ginger, and in English-speaking countries, uh, well, uh, word gingerbread comes straightly from uh, ginger. Ginger is a very healthy spice. Uh, we can make tea uh, from ginger and uh, it is still used as a uh, remedy for, uh, for a cold. Uh, I, I don't have ginger here, but oh, third uh, spice uh, you, uh, you did recognize. Uh, it's a cinnamon. Cinnamon. Yeah. Uh, cinnamon, it's, it is a spice which is uh, made uh, <laughs> from bark of uh, tree. Uh, the best uh, cinnamon uh, comes uh, from Ceylon, but we've got also uh, second kind of uh, cinnamon, uh, which uh, has uh, darker uh, bark, which is harder, which uh, has uh, worse quality, and it comes from China. <laughs> and, uh, okay, this is third. Uh, fourth uh, spice, here. It's a cardamom, and it oh, is cardamom is nice yeah. stuff, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, and it is third most expensive spice uh, of the world after saffron and uh, vanilla. Saffron, vanilla, and cardamom. And cardamom are the three most expensive. Yeah. Did exactly. you know that? Yeah. Because you've come here before. <laughs> I've been here. Did you yeah. know that before? Of course. Yeah, you just knew <laughs> that because women know <laughs> secrets. It's incredible. I know. Here, hit me with it. Come on. <laughs> So it's third most expensive uh, spice yeah. of the world. So okay. now you can notice that uh, gingerbread uh, were uh, expensive. Yeah, okay. uh, from this uh, from this uh, spice, uh, the people made uh, first perfumes of the world uh, in the times of ancient uh, Egypt. Today we can uh, meet cardamom in Indian restaurant, and uh, people. Um, uh, give cardamom, add cardamom to uh, coffee, but mm -hmm. also, uh, also cardamom and uh, ginger mm -hmm. uh, are uh, aphrodisiacs. Too. Yeah, I, yeah. That, I knew that, <laughs> but it's not helping. Uh -huh. Aha. <laughs> I don't know because <laughs> <laughs> didn't change my friend. <laughs>